The epistle reading is Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with the 12th verse. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of God for the people of God. What a lovely, powerful, poignant passage. You could read this uh, every day for the rest of your life, and the benefits to that would be just immeasurable. It has so many fine phrases. I mean, one I hadn't thought about much until this week is it, it speaks of God as the one with whom we have to do. I mean, I love that. God is the one with whom we have to do to do. You, you cannot think about God. You can pretend there's not a God. You can trivialize God. You can think you're hiding from God. But God is the one with whom we have to do. Nothing is hidden from God. And that's not spoken to scare you. That is to be a great comfort. God knows everything about you. God knows you better than you know your own self. And God loves. God is always with you. God never abandons you. This passage also speaks of God's word being sharper than a two-edged sword. That sounds a little dangerous if you're thinking about a sword fight, three musketeers or something. But the sword we might have in mind would be the loving scalpel of the surgeon. There's something in you that will be the undoing of you, and God's word removes that so that you can be healed, so that you can be healthy. We all know how much words matter at the end of the day. Someone says, I love you. Someone says, I'm proud of you. Someone says just, I remembered you and called to check on you. I was talking to a friend the other day, just in considerable desolation, and he asked if I had any counsel for him, and I said, I, I know, but I'm just so sorry you're going through this, and I love you. It's kind of all we have to offer, but at the end of the day, it's a wonderful thing. God speaks to us. God loves us. What's captured most of my attention today is this phrase, we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. And what that means is that we have a high priest. We have Jesus who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. This whole business of sympathy is so important, and when you see it in action, it's absolutely awe-inspiring. On Monday of this week, it became clear that our friends down in South Carolina, that houses were underwater, that canals had been breached, the dams were broken, the streets were standing in water. And so we called down there and said, what do you people need? And they put, we put out an appeal and we were, they were flooded. We were flooded with your response to this. And it was compassion. It was sympathy. We thought about what would it feel like for your house to be underwater? You can't blame somebody. You shouldn't let your house get underwater, right? We have sympathy. We hurt. We feel for them and we respond. How shall we say it? God is the master of sympathy. I mean, Hebrews says that Jesus was without sin, and I think we miss that. I think we think that means that Jesus said, nope, not doing that. Oh, I am not doing that one either, and uh -uh, you'll never catch me doing that. I don't think that's Jesus' sinlessness. I would suggest to you, Jesus' sinlessness is this. Every time Jesus encountered anybody, his ego never got in the way of him hearing and listening to and caring about the other person. He was always able to get inside the other person's feelings. When Jesus thought about God, he never let his ego get in the way of what God was about. He totally understood God's mind and God's heart. 
that that was his purity, that was his goodness. And this is great news for us because it means that we have a God who always listens, who understands us from the inside out. I mean, if I were to give any reason for why bother being Christian as opposed to some other religion, it would be something like this, is that what we believe is that God did not remain aloof in heaven, but instead God came down as this child who fell and he scraped his knee. And one of the gospels that didn't make it into the Bible said that there were other boys on the playground who made fun of Jesus. Like, I believe that. And when Jesus was grown, I mean, the very people closest to him didn't understand him. They rejected him and they hurt him. And he suffered pain and he suffered death at a very young age. And I mean, what that means is that whatever you feel, whatever's going on with you, Jesus knows that from the inside out. Jesus redeems it. He is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. It's a great thing. But Hebrews also says that Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So wherever Jesus went, we're called to follow him there. If Jesus was really good at being attentive to other people, at being sympathetic with other people, then we're called to do the same. If Jesus was really attentive to the mind and heart of God, then we're called to be attentive to the mind and heart of God. Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, once said, I want my heart to be broken by the things that break the heart of God. I want to feel what God feels. I want to think what God thinks. This whole ability to be sympathetic with other people, to get inside their mind, is so elusive. Uh, We're not really good at it uh, at all. Uh, I can confess this to you. As a husband, uh, I think 13 consecutive years, I was set back a grade. I wasn't allowed to advance because each year I took husband 101 and flunked. And the reason that I flunked is that my poor wife, why did she stay with me through all of this? She would regularly, early in our marriage, sit down with me and she would say, oh, I feel, I mean, however you finish that sentence. She might say, I feel like I don't have any friends. And I would say, oh, are you crazy? You have plenty of friends. How could you possibly think that you don't have any friends? This is so stupid to do. And what I have learned to do now is when Lisa sits down and she begins any sentence with, I feel what I do is I do this. I go, hmm. (laughs) And this is really effective. It's only effective, though, if I'm not just, you know, just doing it for the heck of it, just like, "Mm hmm. But if I'm actually really listening to her and really feeling what she feels and showing her that, like, I care, maybe I feel what she's feeling, uh, we miss the, I'm doing a program in a couple of weeks on the will of God. And one of the things that happens with God's will is, you know, something bad happens to someone. They're suffering a death. And we go to that person. We're trying to comfort them. And we inevitably say, I know how you feel. Let us never say, I know how you feel. Like, maybe your spouse died and you're going to somebody whose spouse died, but you have no clue how they feel because their marriage was different from yours. Their spouse was different from yours. They are different from you. Their disease was different from yours. You don't have to say, I know how you feel. There's a better option for those of us who are God's people. And that is we say, how does that feel? Listen, they can tell you. Then you'll actually know how they feel. Parents miss this with their children. They think they know what's best for their children. They're well-intended. They love their children more than life itself. But parents do not always know what is best for their children. History is littered with the stories of great people who've done amazing things contrary to what their parents thought was the best thing for them. Pietro and Pica Bernardone wanted their son, who became St. Francis, to be a cloth merchant in France, but he wanted to be, go figure, against his parents' wishes, St. Francis of Assisi. We don't always know. This bedevils our mission work, by the way. We think we know what other people need, and we just don't know. Right today, my daughter Sarah is in Haiti. She's in a worship service right now, and uh, you're getting off lucky. The service she's in in Haiti is going to go on for about four hours. We're letting you guys out at 1045, so... 
And Haiti, we have a group that's going down to Haiti on Wednesday this week, and Haiti's a really interesting place. Every time there's a hurricane, it sweeps across Haiti and it ruins the crops. They don't have any food. It's a horrible place to live. So difficult, wonderful people there. So what inevitably happens when there's a a hurricane in Haiti is all these canned goods start showing up because we're Americans and we know they need canned goods because they're hungry people. But as it turns out, there's something in the Haitian constitution that whatever it is that preserves canned goods inside the cans actually makes Haitians sick. So when they get canned goods, they throw them away. One of these novel things that you can do is you can call somebody in Haiti and say, what do you guys need? And they'll tell you. This happened in Colombia this week. We called down to Colombia and said, what do you guys need? Somebody put out where they don't need water in Colombia. I thought, I'll check this out. I called three clergy that I know in Colombia. They said, we can't get rid of the water quick enough. People were so desperate for it. What's needed? Toys. That's always interesting. At Christmas, we have inevitably people that want to give toys to children, and that's, that's a lovely thing to want to give toys to children. But we actually have poor children that, I mean, a toy is okay, but what they'd really love would be something like, I don't know, new underwear? Like if you've never had new underwear, you've always had hand-me-down underwear with holes in it. Hey, you got some new underwear? You've always got hand-me-down jackets that somebody like us, like we got rid of an old jacket that was worn out, but maybe you get a new jacket for once. Like that would be an amazing thing. Toxic charity is all about the rich doing for the poor before listening to the poor. All these issues that we face in society would benefit greatly from us just being the kind of people that Jesus was. Jesus was able to get inside other people's heads and listen to them and understand them and sympathize. I saw an amazing thing in my neighborhood the other day. At least now we're out and some other neighbors were out and I witnessed a miraculous conversation. I saw two people. One is really against guns. And the other is a member of the NRA who owns a lot of guns and thinks they're great. And I want, this is amazing. They talked to each other. They listened to each other. And at some point in the conversation, I heard each one of them say, you got a good point. It's like the kingdom of God dawned on Richardson Drive before my very eyes. Same-sex marriage, we talk about this, right? The laws change, the churches are trying to figure out what to do, and you have people who think, yes, we should marry, yes, and other people think, oh, it's terrible, and these people never talk to each other. They never say, what's your life like? Why why do you want to get married in the eyes of God? And the other side never says, well, if you think this is a bad idea, what's that about? Why? What is that for you? How do you feel about that? Race. Uh, race is one of those things a lot of charlatans just don't like to talk about. But it's actually pretty interesting because what's interesting to me, I run into this all the time. I run into African Americans. They think they know what white people are like. And I run into white people all the time who think they understand the African American community and what's going on. And we don't know each other at all, as it turns out. Um, it's funny. I was talking to a guy the other day. He said, We don't have a race problem in Charlotte. I <laughs> said, Really? This is so interesting. I'll give you a couple of examples. I have a friend, pastor friend. We text each other every Sunday morning. He's African-American. He was speaking at a conference down in Miami recently, and he was checking into the Ritz-Carlton. So he was in line at the registration desk, and the guy in front of him is a white guy, finished registering. And when he turned, he saw my friend, and he said, uh, hey, take my luggage up to 304. My friend said, it would be a real honor to help you, but why did you ask me? And I have another friend, African-American pastor, he drives a Mercedes. He went to the Y on his lunch hour, so he's sweaty in the car. A policeman pulls him over and says, hey, buddy, where'd you get that car? So my friend pulled out a cell phone, uh, Rodney Monroe, who was then the chief of police, was a friend of his. He dialed Rodney up. Rodney got it. He said, uh, Rodney, I've got him here with Officer uh, Johnson. I think he'd like to speak with you about now. <laughs> really awkward conversation. <laughs> But it happens at every level. There's a woman here at 8.30 that I really love and admire, and she's white. She has a friend who's African-American, and they're retired, and they just tool around Charlotte together. They go shopping, they go to restaurants, they go to museums. They just they do life together around Charlotte. She says over and over and over again, what you see is they'll be like at a, at a checking out or something, and her friend will kind of fumble in her purse a minute, like it'll take her a minute, and inevitably the person operating the, the cash register will go, <sighs> But if she does the same thing, the person at the register inevitably will say, don't worry, it's fine, you're good. So it happens all 
the time. I grew up in a poor family. My parents had no education, but nobody looked at me as a white guy and said, he probably won't make it. Everybody believed that I could make it. How do we get inside each other's skin? This is an odd thing about Charlotte. I love, I love Charlotte. I've invested my life in the city of Charlotte. You love Charlotte. Well, I bet there are those of you who don't love Charlotte. You're stuck in Charlotte <laughs> for some reason or another. But I love Charlotte. So then I'm grieved when I read these things that come out. They did a study a few years ago, the 50 largest cities of, in America in terms of economic mobility. Like, we're capitalists. We believe in this, right? If you work hard and you do well, you can climb the ladder of success. I mean, that's the creed of Americans, right? But as it turns out, when they rank the 50 largest cities in America, the lowest in social mobility, the people least likely to be able to climb up that ladder live in Charlotte, North Carolina. And then there was another study by Robert Putnam of Harvard. They studied, this was just 40 cities, in terms of social trust among the races of Charlotte. Okay, we did a little better here. We came in 39th out of 40. It's hard, it's hard for me to believe. I love Charlotteans. We're good-hearted people. But we don't know each other. We don't sympathize with each other. We think we know each other, but we do not. I think God's calling us to do better. I think God's calling us to do better. Our church is big enough that if we joined hands with a few other churches and worked on this kind of stuff, like how do you really help people? How do you really work on race? How do you talk about guns? How do you do all this stuff? If we could do that, if we could do that, we wouldn't be 50th or 39th anymore. More importantly, we'd be doing God's will. I'm going to class on God's will. What I'm telling you today, I'm positive. I'm positive it's God's will. We are so fortunate. We have a God who sympathizes with us. He gets inside our skin. He knows how we feel. He loves. He encourages. He helps. God wants us to follow him, be the kind of people who get inside other people's skins, and listen, care, love. We have not a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We're weak at this. But God is strong. He can help us. We can do better. We can be the people of God. Thanks be to God.